Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. Uh, my name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson number 155, we'll take a look at what's called the Infinity Architecture Anti-Pattern. You can get a listing of all of the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday from my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. A lot of lessons do come from these two books I recently wrote with Neil Ford. Uh, this one I don't think is in there. This deviates from some prior material. And I want to talk about, and it's fun to talk about, anti-patterns. Uh, this specific anti-pattern, um, as a matter of fact, just came up last week uh, during a particular conference uh, about is it possible to do like a generic architecture? And the question specifically was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm told by my product manager and, and business people to look for a generic solution to this. Does that even exist? Well, uh, I brought up the Infinity Architecture Anti-Pattern and thought, oh, what a great, uh, what a great uh, topic for another Software Architecture Monday lesson. Uh, but the Infinity Architecture Anti-Pattern is creating architectures that are overgeneralized to provide basically unlimited flexibility. And that's where it gets its name. Now, there's a really good example of the Infinity Architecture Anti-Pattern that some of you may remember from the late 90s, and that was the IBM's San Francisco project. Now, this project was actually uh, cited as one of the largest Java projects in the world at that time, and it was around 1998, I believe. And the point is, IBM set out with a... Uh, whole slew of developers to basically write um, essentially the last business application to create a generic platform. As a matter of fact, uh, let me read you what the goals were here because it was a distributed platform independent architectural framework for all business applications. That was the project. And it provided a foundation of reusable business objects and business process components. And basically, these things together would encapsulate all business functionality, ledger, sales, inventory, customer management. And this framework or foundation would be able to be used as a head start to just oh tweak it a little bit for your own purpose. And that was the idea behind the IBM San Francisco project, a great example of trying to create something that was infinitely flexible and overgeneralized. Well, <clears throat> those of you who know the story know that this project failed miserably. It didn't work, not because they used Java, uh, not because it was the world's largest, but because of something called the infinite regression problem or the infinite regress problem. You see, when you're trying to develop code that satisfies every possible solution, you start to get varying levels of granularity. And you have certain different propositions and assertions and assumptions that require a truth of prior positions, propositions, and assertions that require a truth of prior propositions and assertions. And this keeps going down and down and down to basically infinity, which is a great other example of the infinity architecture anti-pattern. You see, the bottom line here of all of this infinity architecture anti-pattern and general frameworks and general foundations for all business applications is that all architecture, every bit of it exists within a context. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you two examples. The first example actually does come from our book, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture. So I guess I was wrong at the beginning. <laughs> Some of it does come from that book. Uh, but essentially, uh, Neil Ford and I created these star ratings, uh, one star being not so well supported and five stars being extremely well supported, like it's natural fit for that architecture style of various architecture characteristics. And you could easily see through this star chart that different architectures have strong points in different areas. 
You know, the monolithic architectures that we actually see here, um, their strong points really are in areas of cost and simplicity. Whereas the strong points on distributed architectures start to get in some of these operational characteristics over here. Uh, things like elasticity and agility and integration and interoperability performance, uh, these sort of things. So if that's not proof alone that it's not possible to even build a general architecture because there's no way to analyze any sort of strengths or weaknesses from the characteristics it must support because every single problem is different and has different characteristics. As a matter of fact, one of the things I used to do back in the day uh, when I talked about the infinity architecture anti-pattern was to say one way to avoid this anti-pattern is to do what I used to call domain-based architecture. In other words, thinking about the problem domain and what sort of architectural characteristics or attributes are needed for that. For example, in trading, if we're doing financial stock trading, high throughput, large data volumes, and super high performance are what's needed. A generic architecture won't satisfy these needs. As a matter of fact, it differs greatly from, let's say, insurance companies, which have really complex rules-based processing, enterprise component sharing, which is why service-oriented architecture was always originally such a good fit within insurance companies, and large systems integration of heterogeneous systems. That's the nature of the architectures that need to support insurance. And even if we think about things like financial services and banking that need high levels of data consistency and high levels of data integrity, uh, data and access security is paramount to these architectures, as well as very typically batch processing, which happens a lot in banks and financial apps services, app, um, applications, or companies, as well as overall accuracy. But before I leave you on this Software Architecture Monday lesson, I want to talk about another aspect of infinity architecture anti-pattern, and that is about contracts. And this I have seen, unfortunately, a lot in the field, where we start creating generalized contracts between components to provide infinite flexibility. But, everyone, we pay a price. And this is what I'm talking about. Let's so say we have two services and we need a contract, but we know it's going to change. We're not sure what data we need yet because it's early on in the system. And we know we're going to expand the system later on. Well, why not just create a simple key value map, like a hash map or something like this, so that it's just consists of name value pairs? Then we can expand the contract anytime we want to. We just keep adding fields. Well, this is a response to that kind of problem and is another aspect of the infinity architecture anti-pattern because this is all well and good. But where is the contract. You see, all I see are a bunch of name value pairs. I don't know which of those service two is actually using. I may not know the data types, for example, on here. Uh, if service one wants to change one of those, I have no idea who I'm going to break. And in order to actually see the quote contract that service two is actually using, I actually have to go and paw through a lot of source code. And so this is yet another mm, form of the infinity architecture anti-pattern when we start to go more into the details and look at contracts and such. All right, well, like I said, it's always fun to throw in an anti-pattern or true two here. I try to do that every couple of months, and I just thought since this came up last week, that this would be a good lesson to do. So, uh, so this has been lesson 155, the infinity architecture anti-pattern. Hopefully, I have convinced you there is no such thing as a general purpose architecture. And if somebody wants you to build one, um, just point them to this short 10-minute lesson. Awesome. Thank you so much. And stay tuned in two more Mondays uh, for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.